Well, it's good to see you. This morning, we're going to dig in and talk about uh, one of the most blessed, probably one of the most well-known, probably one of the most misapplied promises in Scripture. And it's, uh, it's pertaining to the all things of God in Romans 8, 28. And in Romans 8, 28, the Bible tells us these words. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. And probably every single one of us have heard this quoted or we've quoted this to somebody else and we've tried to encourage them, whatever they might be going through, but sometimes it's misapplied. As a matter of fact, I began to do study on this verse last Monday morning because I knew I'd be out of town through a part of the week and had to have a lot of stuff under my belt by the time I got back in. And I zeroed in on this very thing that God said in his word, the all things. You know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in life. All the things go on in life, don't they? We find ourselves in the all things up on top as winners, as victors, as those who are recipients and, and those who are, you know, at the very top of our game. At other times in those all things, we find ourselves in a ditch. We find ourselves down deep. And it's hard to get a perspective on what God's doing. But God, the Bible tells us, works together for good these things that happen in our lives for those of us that love him and that are called according to his purpose. And you know, I've been uh, privileged to do a little bit of backpacking in my life, and I, I love to do that. And maybe it's the time of the year I was kind of daydreaming about taking a trip up the Appalachian Trail or something. But you know, when you're climbing one of those peaks and you've got that backpack on your back and, and you're just trudging along, sometimes, you know, you, you can't see what all is off in, in one direction or another because you're surrounded, you know, by the forest. But when you reach the, the summit, when you reach the precipice, you can look off not just to the north or to the south, but to the the east and the west as well, and you begin to comprehend just a little bit of all that is around you and the beauty and the glory uh, of those beautiful mountains. And, and uh, you know, there, there's so much that can be seen from the summit. And to get to the summit, though, we always have to go through the valley. And I have discovered that in life, and to reach the peaks that God oftentimes has for me, I have to go through the valley. Sometimes you go through the desert. You go through the dry place, and sometimes you're just stuck in the rut. And, and, you know, you can't get a perspective about what God's doing in your life, and you can't see what God's doing because of the, of the elevation in which you have found yourself. But on the summit, we can each get, catch a glimpse of the wonder of God in all that he is. As a matter of fact, Isaiah the prophet, he put, he put it in words like this. In chapter 40, verse 31, he said, But the people who trust in the Lord will become strong again. They'll rise up as an eagle in the sky. They will run and not become tired. They'll run and not become tired. And what God is talking about, he's, he's talking about as we trust in him, as we trust in him for all those things in our life, for all those moments in our lives, whether, you know, it feels like the darkness is upon us, whether it feels like we're down in the valley or up on the mountaintop, as we trust in him, he completely renews our strength. He completely re-energizes re us. He completely lifts us up and we're able to run and not grow tired. But, you know, as I find in life, the trouble is, is when we find ourselves in the valley or we find ourselves in the rut or we find ourselves, you know, uh, surrounded by the forest, sometimes we can't see God. We're not sure that God is still looking after us like we would want him to. And there's trouble in our world today. There's trouble all over the world. It doesn't matter where you go, you find trouble. And there's trouble in the family today. And there's trouble in individual lives today. And, and you know, if you're not in trouble right now, you just got out of trouble, you're heading for trouble. Trouble surrounds us. And, and oftentimes, you know, we, we mess up. We fail to see that God is there. We fail to see God's hand that is there holding on to us. And we fail to see God for as big as God is. Ott, the guy up here on electric guitar, quoted uh, something I said in a message a few weeks ago. And, and um, you know, he said, you don't have to tell God how big your struggle is or how big your storm is or how big your difficulty is. Tell your difficulty or your storm or your struggle how big God is. We serve a mighty and awesome God. He's mighty to save. He's, he's awesome to love us. He, he cares for us. 
And oftentimes people fail to see God as big as he is, and they see themselves really, you know, bigger. They see themselves at, at the center of the universe, you know, and, and as people, you know, we've had, you know, so much progress. There's been so much technology, and, and we've, we've uh, gone so far medically and so far scientifically that uh, through all that progress, you know, we have regressed from God. And so we begin to act like the two-year-old, thinking that the world revolves around us. You know, that's what two-year-olds do. That's why they call it the two, terrible twos. They're just making that transition from that infanthood, you know, where you jump to their every squeal, to their every cry, to their every move, to their every uh, sound that they make. You know, what can I do for you? To, you know, by the time they're two, and especially if they're the second or third one along, you're going, ah. You know, and they have a hard time with that. And they're saying, wait a minute, don't you know the house revolves around me? Don't you know that you're here for me? You're here for my purpose. And sometimes that's the way we treat God. We think, okay, God, you know, don't you know that, that, uh, that I'm the sinner? And don't you know that you're here for me? But really, we're here for him. And, and that's something we've got to grab a hold of. And, and, you know, one of the things I've discovered, you know, um, is, is that people ask this question, then why do I really need God in my life? Because they've got the technology, they've got things medically, they've got things scientifically, they've got all that stuff going on. And, and, you know, why do I really need God? Until they need God. And, you know, I've been in some pretty deep valleys in my life. Several years ago, it's been a, more than several years ago, back when Beverly and I didn't have kids, we had uh, been to the Grand Canyon, and, and we went all the way down into the canyon, you know, to the river. We couldn't get backcountry permits uh, because, you know, they were all out for that week. So uh, I said, it's only six miles down, six miles up, we can do that. You know, I had to do it in a day. But when we got all the way down to the river, all the way down to the Colorado, you know, your perspective changes. Up on the rim, you can see across the canyon, you can see the light and the vistas, you can see, you know, the colors and all that's there. You can see the, the, um, uh, the Commodore fly, you can see all these different things. But down in the valley, you look down, you're down as far as you can go, you see the river. And you look up and think, man, i got to climb to the top of that before dark. And, and when you're looking up, you know, you don't see that grand vista that you once saw. We've been on some of the, the highest peaks in North America. We've crossed peaks, uh, you know, all across the West. And, and uh, I was reminded yesterday as I was watching something on Travel Channel, and they had something about Glacier National Park and, uh, you know, the highway to the sun. We've driven up that. My kids uh, that had never, I think it was Lydia that had never seen snow at that point. So the very first time that she ever saw snow was when we were up there in the middle of uh, June or July on top of the peak. And looking out, the vistas were amazing. And God says, you know, that he works in our lives so as to lift us up so that we don't grow tired, so that we can get these amazing views and we can know that God is in control of all things. And you know, when I, when I find myself overlooking those kinds of views, you know, one of the things I, I, I feel at times is, wow, God, you know, I'm so small, I'm so insignificant. How could you even be mindful of me? The psalmist put it this way in Psalm number 8, verses 3 and 4. He said, I look at your heavens. I look at your heavens, which you've made with your fingers, and I see the moon and the stars which you created. But why are people important to you? Why do you take care of human beings? You ever thought about that? You know, like the Milky Way. My son and I were out walking on the driveway last night as I was walking the dog, and, and uh, we looked up and he said, the sky is clear, but it seems like, Dad, you can't see as many stars as we once could when we first moved out here. And I said, well, no, not this time of the year. You know, I said, look at all that light coming up from over towards, uh, you know, the Destin Commons and, and over in this direction. Look at all that light coming up from the golf garden, which is nighttime golf. And, you know, it kind of makes those stars fade. But I remember the first time I saw the Milky Way and all this glory on the edge of the Sahara Desert, I looked up in the sky and I'd never seen so many stars in my life. And I said, no wonder they call it the Milky Way. We've just never seen it. And sometimes we have that same light, you know, it, it, the reason we can't see it is light pollution. And sometimes we get polluted by the things that we can't see all the wonder of what God is and who God is and all that God is. But when I look and when I, con and, and when I think about it and when I comprehend and when I meditate, I'm just like the psalmist. And, and I ask this question, but why am I important to you, God? Why are my fellow human beings important to God? 
Well, I want to give you a little background. And the very first thing we've got to discover in the background is that, that he is the God of all things and the God of creation. He's the all things of creation. In John 1, 3, the Bible says, Through him, that is Christ, all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. In other words, Jesus Christ is co-eternal, co-existent with the Father. And man, you know, we can do some pretty awesome stuff. I mean, you think about some of the stuff that we can do, and it is absolutely awesome. Anybody got a neat trick you can show us right now? Anybody want to volunteer? Come right up here on the stage and show me a neat trick. Nobody's feeling that awesome this morning? But you know, we build space shuttles. Oh, I know the space shuttle, you know, program has come to an end, but when it was going full blast, no pun intended, you know, it blasts off into space, and there's always a marvelous, a uh, moving thing to, to take in and comprehend. And it'd go into space, they'd do their things, and here it would come sailing back, and oftentimes it would land here in Florida. And you think, man, how did they steer that thing to get it there? And then when they get ready to retire it, they put it on the back of a 747. They fly it to California. They tow it with a Toyota truck, according to the commercial, to its uh, place uh, at the museum where, you know, it's on, on exhibit. And, and, you know, we do some amazing stuff. We build roads. We build highways. We build bridges that go over the rivers and that go over the canyons that are oftentimes, uh, you know, uh, give us, um, you know, uh, the ability to transport. But all the stuff that we do, whether it be the highest building in the world as the one in, uh, in um, Dubai called the uh, Karaj or the Burj Kahafi, which is 2,717 feet tall with 163 floors. How would you like to climb all those when the elevators are out? To the highways, everything we do is made out of existing material. But that's not the way God created. This God of all things created everything that we know out of no thing, out of nothing. He spoke and the world came into being. And he spoke and there was light in the world. He spoke and the land was formed. He spoke and the mountains and the rivers and the seas came into existence. He spoke and made trees and flowers and grass. He spoke and the sun and the moon and the stars glittered across the heavens. He spoke and the birds flew in the air and the animals began to walk. He spoke and the waters, uh, the Bible says they teem. They were filled with a fish. And he spoke and all things that in the world are created. And yet as he looked at all those things, you know what God said? God said it's not enough. Because, you know, what relationship does a fish have with God? Does a, does a fish commune with God? Does a fish comprehend God? You know, what relationship does all this created matter have to do with God? And so this is what God said in Genesis 1.27. He said, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so why did God create us in his image? He created us in his image that we might be a people that walk with him, that connect with him, that correspond with him, that talk with him, that walk in a relationship with him. He created us in his own image and he gave us dominion over all this earth that he had made out of nothing. All these things God spoke and man stood before him. And as man stood before him, he's, he's untouched by sin. He's unjaded. He, 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 he's unspotted. And man stands before God as the crowning jewel of the all things of creation. There's no sin, there's no guilt, there's nothing to be ashamed of. There stands man before God. And, and you know, that's a pretty awesome deal. And, and when I think about this body that God has given us, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. Did you know that in our human body, approximately six quarts of blood are, are within us? And every 60 seconds, our, our uh, heart pumps about, you know, one and a half gallons of blood through us. And that means that every 24 hours, there's some 2,160 gallons of blood that pump through this human heart and flow throughout the body. And did you hear that? What do you hear with? You hear with your ear. You think about the, the marvel of sound. And you can distinguish between the clanging of a hammer on metal and the streets and the and the sweet string sounds of a violin or a harp you know a couple of weeks ago we had the Annie Moses band here uh, in concert how many of you were here for that how many of you'd say it was awesome that we're here 
You know, if you don't know who they are, you need to go on Google, type in Annie Moses, go and listen. It's a family of uh, X number of kids, a bunch of them. They've all been trained through the Juilliard School in, in New York. They're absolutely amazing. But with your ear, you're able to distinguish the sound between a hammer hitting metal and the sounds of a violin string or a harp string. And, and God has blessed you with that. And think about your eye. You know, your eye takes all these images, you know, thousands of pixels or whatever you were going to call them. And, and, and it records in high definition. And, and it, it's played onto a high definition screen within your brain. Even, you know, this is long before Sony came out with high definition TV. You know, and, and you've got a DVR up here too because you can rewind and go back to scenes at other places in your life. You know, God has, has made you in an awesome and, and, and marvelous, marvelous way. And, 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 and so the psalmist says, I will praise you because I'm fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. Your works, Lord, are wonderful. And I know that full well. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God, thank you for the way you made me. How many of you have told God that lately? God, thank you for the way you made me. Thank you that I'm such a handsome creature. Thank you that I'm such a beauty. Thank you that I'm such a blessing to others. How many of you know that you're a blessing to other people? See, you've got to get a view of who you are. God created you to be a blessing not only to him, but he created you to be a blessing to others. You are the crowning jewel of his creation. And when I look at tremendous waterfalls or when I peer over the edge of the Grand Canyon or I find myself inside a cavern with all of its mysterious displays or, or see the beauty of the radiant colors of the sunrise or the sunset, you know, I see and I hear and I taste and I feel and I sense the wonder of God in all these things. You know, I'm amazed at what Jesus tells us. In John 15, 15, he said, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. I call you friends. But not everybody in this room can say, well, I am a friend of God. And those of us that can say, I am a friend of God, perhaps we need to be reminded of how we became that friend of God. You know, I was, um, I was talking with two people at the, at the last service. As a matter of fact, in the last worship service, two people got saved. Two people came to a, a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ in their hearts and their lives. Isn't that awesome? Praise God. How many of you tweet? How many of y'all are Twitter, Twitterers? Okay, right now, let's just take a break. Let's pull out our smartphone and let's tweet this out. Praise God. At Village Destin, two people trusted Jesus at 9 o'clock. Let's give glory to God. You know why I hold it in? You know, we put it out there on Twitter, Twittering, and people read it all over. I just, I'm upset that nobody's responded yet. But tweet it out. I learned that trick the other day. I learned it from a 78-year-old man. He told us to tweet out this good news. You know? I said, well, shoot, we ought to be doing that at church every Sunday. Every time something good happens, we ought to tweet it. Give God glory. That's cool. But two people got saved. Now, what was I saying? Where was I in all of this? You know, how does it happen? Well, it happens because God is the all things of, of, of regeneration. You know, that's the big fancy word for coming to, into a relationship with Christ. It's the big word for having Christ's peace rule and reign within our heart. It's the big fancy word that is uh, not quite as big and fancy as redemption because we use that a little bit more. And, and you know, these, these couple people that, that, uh, that came to trust Jesus Christ, they came to trust him because they needed peace. They needed his reign they needed his rule in the book of second corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 the bible says therefore if anyone is in christ he is a new creation the old is gone the new has come now god made all things grab that you know and when god created us here we are we're standing we're standing as the crowning jewel of his creation we're spotless we're blameless we're without sin man you look so good you looked so good before sin affected you and infected you. You looked awesome. But man broke God's law. God said, you know, you can do anything in the world you want to do, but this one tree, this one piece of fruit, you don't touch it. Don't touch it. What'd we do? The very thing that we weren't to touch, 
That's the very thing that we did, and we got all messed up in it, didn't we? And when we got messed up in it, we got infected. An infection grabbed a hold of us, and that infection is the infection of sin, and sin, as a result, eventually brings death. Therefore, from the very moment that we're born, uh, you know, physically into this world, we're preparing to die. Because, you know, our, you know, when you're brand new, you know, you're reproducing all these cells and everything, you grow up, and then they start dying off, and you grow old, and you go out. It has infected us because man did not obey God. But God didn't leave us like that. God had a plan. It was a plan that was costly to him, free to us, but of highest value. And in that plan, you know, from the very time in the Garden of Eden when we fell, God pronounced that plan of the destruction of sin. As a matter of fact, God speaking, he says, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head, and you will strike him on the heel. You know what that means? It means, you know, a serpent. You crush its head, what is it? It rhymes. You crush a serpent's head, it is dead. God said you will bruise his heel when he does this. You get a bruised heel, you'll walk with a limp for a little bit, you know, but it's not going to kill you. The serpent was dealt, Satan was dealt the death blow when he bit Christ on the hill on Calvary's cross. But Jesus Christ rose the victor. Had he remained in the grave, the serpent would have gone on. But he rose victorious. He crushed the serpent. He was victorious over all and in all things. So God had a plan. God made a way. 2,000 years later then, God sends forth his son. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Here's that term again. All things, all things came into being through him and apart from him. Nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And the son was the light that would give us guidance back to the father. You know, when we get decrepit from our sin and blinded from our sin and our hearing fails because of sin and our senses dull because of sin, we've got to have one that's going to guide us back into the relationship. We're guided back into a relationship with the Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ the Son who is the light and the life of men. And so the very first thing Jesus does then in that process of all things of regeneration, redemption, getting saved, coming to know him, is he gives us a brand new life in, G in himself. And in that new life, you know, we live, he, sa he saves us from the pit of sin. Listen to what the psalmist said in Psalm 40, verse 2. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock, and he gave me a firm place to stand. You know, he, he took me out of that slimy pit. Have you ever been in a slime pit? You know, if you've come through our Awana ministry, you, uh, you know, you've gotten to, to slime a teacher here or there. Or maybe it's Vacation Bible School we slime the, the worship pastors. That is it Vacation Bible School the worship pastor gets slimed? Okay. That's, that's, what, that's what I've been told. You know, I didn't tell you this, Matt, when we were interviewing. I, I, I slipped my mind completely. But, you know, the, the, the deal is, is, you know, we've all felt the slime before. A number of years ago when I was in college, we used to do a lot of spelunking, cave exploring. And, and on one of these particular trips, you know, we've been down in the cave and we're coming back up and there's a, a hole we've got to crawl through that's maybe 10 feet long and it's going up like that. And as we're going along, you know, there's one guy with us, we call him Mikey. Mikey can't get through. He's a little bit heavy. It's not that he wouldn't fit through, but, you know, he just didn't have the physical strength to pull himself up. And he would get up a little bit and he'd go sliding back down. I'm thinking, man, you may have to lose 20 or 30 pounds and we'll come back and get you in three weeks, you know because I don't think we can pull you. It ended up that, you know, two of us have arms in like this, pulling on each of his arms, and there's two down below him pushing up on his feet, you know, to get him out. But when we got out of that, this is what he said, back to the, to the opening of the cave, back on solid rock, so to speak. This is what he said, I will never, ever do that again. How many of us have found ourselves in a slimy, muddy, miry pit and said, God, if you'll deliver me, I will never go back there again. You know, we've done that a lot of times, haven't we? I'll never go back. 
And so he gives us his brand new life and he gives us his brand new loyalty. In Christ, you know, he sets us free. We're no longer held by the, by the grip of sin. The Lord Jesus, quoting the book of Isaiah, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. The Lord Jesus Christ, he not only regenerates you inside and gives you that relationship with the Father, but he sets you free from the very sin that hangs on to you and binds you and holds you back and keeps you from being you and keeps you from being that blessing to other people and being able to rise up in the morning and say, praise God, I am me. Lord, you have blessed me. I thank you for the way you've made me. I thank you for the gifts you've given me that I might serve you for your glory, for your honor, for your fame, for your praise, that I might be the me that you really created me to be. So he, he gives us that new life. He, he gives us that new loyalty. He gives us that new longing, that new desire. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 17, the world, you know, uh, and its desires, they pass away. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. You know, before I, I was sold out to Christ, I had all kinds of desires. I had all these things that I wanted to do. Now, I kind of knew what God wanted me to do, but that wasn't on my agenda because it didn't fit into my plan to have all the other stuff that I wanted to have because I was still thinking it was all about me. And so I had to grow up a little bit. God had to allow some stripping to happen in my life. He had to have, have allow some cutting to, allow, to happen in my life, some refining to allow in my life, some, some molding in my life to bring me to that place where my desires became the desires that he had for me so that I might be the person that he wanted me to be so that I might so that I might stand before him as the crowning jewel of creation not just as a rebellious person but as one who would follow after him in my thinkings and so he regenerates us he's the all things of regeneration thirdly he's the the all things of working together and this is where I want to really break open up the text now the scripture tells us in our text, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who've been called according to his purpose. Now this is one of the most quoted, it's one of the most blessed of promises that we know in the scripture. Yet at times it seems so difficult for us to believe. It can, you know, uh, perhaps be, you know, that, that uh, in our thinking we, we think, God, are you really in control? Maybe God is not in control. Maybe he's not really working out the difficult and the painful and the troublesome stuff in our lives. Hard times come our way and we fail to understand. We fail to see that God's at work. We, we fail to trust him completely. We, we fail to, to trust him when the trial comes. God, I, you know, I, I'm in this and I'm trusting you. God, I'm in this and I'm going to tell this trial that that you're a big God, that you're bigger than it is. I'm not going to tell you how big the trial is because you already know, because you're the God of all things and I'm trusting you. Trial, my God is big. When the temptation comes, God, you know, you know how big the temptation is in my life, but you're bigger. I ask you to give me a way of escape. When, when trouble comes, God, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you completely. And Jesus stands shining his light into our darkness. And we simply need to grab a hold of his hand and be held in the, in the grip of grace. Sometimes, you know, my granddaughter and I are walking along and she'll take my finger and she'll hold it. You know, and if I go to pick her up with her hanging on, her grip's not that strong. You know what's going to happen? She's going to slip off. But, you know, when, when I grab a hold of her, and man, I swing her up above my head and back down through my legs legs and around in circles and all that kind of stuff. She's held in the grip of somebody that loves her that's not going to let go of her. Eventually I have to put her down. I wear out. But grab a hold of this with God. You're held in his grip. His grip is strong. It never grows tired. It never grows weary and it never lets go. Held in the grip of grace. That's why I sign a lot of the stuff I sign in his grip. Because it's not about me. It's not about my accomplishments. It's not about how good I am. None of that kind of stuff because I'm not that good really. Ask my wife. Ask my kids. Ask the dog. Psalm 23, 4 
It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I want to share a different version. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you're with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Even in the darkest of valleys, folks. But to whom do all things work together for good? It doesn't work together for good for everybody. It doesn't say that. It says, for those that love God and that are called according to his purpose. Those that love God. You know, it's the promise of a heavenly father to his children. And that's the reason, you know, that, that we're able to stand beside the, the bed of a loved one that's passing into death that knows Jesus Christ with a calm assurance that everything's going to be okay, with a calm assurance that they're going to be in heaven and in glory with that one. It's why we can come together at Village with those folks that are part of our family that, that die in this life to go on to be with the Lord. And, and we don't have a, a funeral dirge. We have a celebration. We have a celebration of life, of what God is doing. And you know, it's in the times of our greatest trial and temptation and sorrow that we can know the truth of that promise. And it's not just in some things. You know, it, it's not just the good things, the happy things, the wonderful things. You know, when things are good and happy and wonderful, oh God, you know, you're blessing me. Lord, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. Oh Lord, I, 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 I'm getting that new car. Thank you, I'm blessed. I, I'm getting that new home. Thank you, I'm blessed. Oh God, you're giving me this girl to be my girlfriend and to be my wife. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Right? Man, everything's hunky-dory till the car wears out. God, where's the blessing? I'm driving a jalopy. God, where's the blessing? The doors are falling off the hinges on the house. And, and God, this one that I, I blessed you for that came into my life, this intense fellowship, this arguing, this her knowing everything, all this kind of stuff is getting to me. How can I bless you? I bless God in the good, the happy, the joyful times, and I bless God when difficulties come. I bless God when, when difficulties come. You know, we bless God, you know, not just with the good then, but with the bad. And we bless God with the ugly. You know, we often see the good things working for us. But let me tell you that when the bad things happen in our lives, God is at work too. When bad stuff's going on, we often see it. You know, can't see how God's working, but one day we will. I want to read something someone wrote. They said, mystery may engulf you and enemies may attack you and friends may desert you. Satan may buffet you and demons may beset you. Sins may infest you and sickness weaken you. Sorrows may depress you and death rob you and poverty threaten you. Your dreams may vanish and your ship may never come in. And the raging storms may sweep down on you, crushing you with winds and dark clouds and swallowing you. But all things work together for good to them that love the Lord God. You know, I don't know what you're going through. You're going through a difficult situation. My dear brother and sister in Christ... I want you to know that whatever it is, it's working for good. Maybe you're saying, Pastor, I'm not going through. Well, maybe you just came through, and God's worked it for good. You might say, well, Pastor, I'm not going through, and I didn't just come through. Well, look out. It's coming. It's coming. It is coming. But when we're held in that grip of God's grace, we can know. And, and, and then this is in the present tense. You know, you know, it's not God's working for good in the past. It's not God that's working for good in the future. God's working it for good right now in the present, in this very moment, in this very hour. In the darkest night of your struggle, God is working it for good. You know, you may not be able to see any good in this thing and, 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 and all, but that's not a sign that God is not at work. When the darkest hours come and the demons of hell are around you, God has not taken his life from you. He pulls you closer. In Genesis chapter 28, verse 15, the scripture tells us, I am with you. I am with you. Isn't that the great promise? I am with you. That's how the promise of Romans 8, 28 is fulfilled. You know, God is with us in all these things. 
And all these things, you know, they work together for good to those that love him because God says, I am with you. I'm with you. I'm with you and I'll watch over you wherever you go. Wherever you go, I'm watching you and I will bring you back to this land. You know, maybe, you know, whatever it is is taking you away, but God is going to restore. And, and, and I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised through you in bringing many sons to glory, and there will be with him forever in, in, in Christ Jesus. You know, just like a diamond has to be cut to allow the brilliance of light to pass through it, and gold has to be refined to bring out its purity, and the vine has to be pruned to become more productive, and the clay be molded to make a vessel. I mean, think about it. I was watching the potter in North Africa one day on his wheel as he made pots. Man, spinning that wheel with his foot just as fast as he could go, and he'd make the form. And occasionally, he'd collapse it because it wasn't the mold that he wanted it to have. And he'd keep working on that piece of clay till it took on the shape and the form that, that was desired. And that's what God does with us. Sometimes things have to be cut away. Sometimes things have to be burned away, refined, so that we can walk in purity. At, at times, there has to be pruning so that we can be more productive. And at times, we're being molded into that vessel for God's use. You know, you can put on the footnote of every page of your life this word. God reigns. God reigns. And let me sum it up with Christ having first place in all things. Think about this. Colossians 1.18, he's the head of the body, which is the church. Everything comes from him. He is the first one who was raised from the dead. So in all things, Jesus has first place. You know, there have been some great men and women in history. There have been some great people in the history of the world. They came, they saw, they conquered, and they died. But there's never been one like the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came into the world. He walked among men. He died. He conquered sin, death, and the grave, and he rose again. And now the Lord Jesus Christ stands as the highest figure of the universe. The, uh, the, the, the word I love is preeminent. He is the preeminent one who holds first place in all things. He has first place in history, which is really his story. There have been times in the history of the world it seemed as if civilization was on the brink. Some said that God was even dead. But he stands there, you know, the everlasting Christ watching over his own. He has first place in the Bible. The entirety of the Bible reveals Jesus Christ. In Colossians 1.15, the Bible says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything for it was the father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself having made peace to the blood of his cross through him I say whether things on earth are things in heaven Jesus Christ has first place, and he has first place in prophecy. The book of the Revelation, Revelation tells us of a moving event that is going to come at the end of this present age. The greatest one in the drama of the, these events will, uh, is centered upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says he will come from heaven with the shout. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and said, For the Lord himself will come down, not his representative. He's not going to send the Secretary of State. He's not going to send the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of the Interior. He's not going to send Homeland Security. The Lord Jesus Christ himself is going to come down out of heaven. And he's going to come down with a loud command. And he's going to come down with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. Can you imagine? He's going to come. And, and I just kind of imagine what that, that loud shout's going to be with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. It's going to be, church, come home. And the Bible tells us at that moment, at that moment, we are going to rise and we're going to meet him in the air. And there's not going to be any travel delays that day. There's not going to be any backups and sitting on the tarmacs at the airports. 
There's not going to be any red lights to hold us back because he's calling us home. He is calling us home. The Bible says at that time there's going to be seven years of tribulation that are going to break out like the world has never known before. And during that time, his church is going to be with him. At the end of the seven years, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is coming for the second time. See, he hadn't come back when he's called us home. He's just come to the air. The second time is when he comes and puts his foot upon the earth again. And he will reign for a thousand years. Satan is going to be locked away. At the end of that thousand years, he's going to bring it all to an end, the final rebellion of rebellion. Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire. And he's going to give us a home in eternity forever where the doors never squeak and they never fall off, where there's no more leaky kitchen sinks, guys. He's going to give us a home where we're never sick again. He's going to give us a home where we're in the very prime of life. We're going to be surrounded there with other saints of the ages as we surround that beautiful throne of grace that has held us so tightly through the years by the, by the grip of grace. But you know, here's what the question really is this morning, is are you ready? Are you ready? Have you come to a personal place in your life where you've turned from living for yourself, living your own way, seeking your own satisfaction, and turned to Jesus Christ and said, God, I need your help. I need to have forgiveness in my heart and forgiveness in my life. I need to know your peace. I'm sick of trying to do it my way. I want to do it your way. Have you come to that place? I'm praying for you this morning that this will be your day, just like it was for two other people in the last worship service, that this would be your day to know Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me as we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we are standing here before you this morning, and we thank you, Lord God, that you are the all things of all things, that you can be trusted, knowing that we're held in your grip of grace, And Father, for those that don't quite know you yet, I pray that in all things this day, that they will come to know and trust you. Lord Jesus is both Savior and is Lord. Father, for those that are making decisions about church fellowship and being a part of this family, for those that need to take the obedient step of baptism, may this be their day. We pray these things in the mighty and sweet and precious name of Christ Jesus, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Let's stand together. Would you come right now? Come say, Pastor, I want to follow Jesus. Pastor, I want to be a part of this fellowship. I want to take the step of uh, of baptism, obedience. You come right now. No holding back. All of you is more than enough for all of me. For every thirst and every need, you satisfy me with your love. And all I have in you is more than enough. my supply, my breath of life, still more awesome than I know. You are my reward worth living for, still more awesome than I know. And all of you is more than enough for. All of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you is more than enough Sacrifice of greatest price, still more awesome than I 
tweet one more got saved okay you know God's good he's awesome you know you can give God praise too God's doing something in this fellowship right here isn't he don't you just sense the move of God don't you sense the momentum that he's building up getting us ready for the floods of his grace and the floods of his glory Man, I am looking forward to the day when those dead bones that Ezekiel saw, those dry bones, rise up and give glory and praise and honor to the Lord God Almighty. It's going to be quite a day. Okay, today, 4 o'clock. Today, 4 o'clock, Sunday's picnic. All we're asking you to do is bring the side dishes. We got the hamburgers and the hot dogs. If you... Uh, if um, if you'll come, I promise you'll have fun. But here's the deal. At the end of the Sunday's picnic, we're going to wrap up with a short time of worship down on the beach. We've got about five people, I think, that are being baptized in the Gulf. Isn't that awesome today? You know, that, that's, that's awesome. Now, some of you... Some of you have trusted Jesus, but you've never been baptized. You've had a lot of excuses down through the years. Man, there's too many people in there. I'm afraid of heights. You know, whatever else. Let me tell you. One of the people being baptized is Gina. Gina, uh, I'm not certain she's still in here right now, but Gina runs around here in the electric wheelchair. And she's been waiting to get baptized. I've told her when the Gulf gets warm, I didn't want to do it back in January, you know, because the wheelchairs don't fit in the baptistry. There she is, but she's got a testimony to, to share. And if Gina can get baptized in the Gulf, you, you're without excuse. You're just without excuse, right? So I'm going to give you this invitation. You bring your shorts and a T-shirt tonight. We will baptize you as well. Dan and I are going to be out there, and if we get so many people being baptized, Matt's going to join in. We may join him in anyway, and, and uh, because he says he's going to be wet from the dunking booth. But, uh, you know, we're, we're, going, we're going to give praise to God about what God is doing. So y'all be here tonight. God bless you. Have an awesome day, and uh, to him be the glory. You're dismissed.